Hi, I'm Ben Greasley, and in this video we're going to look at cameras within Arnold. We're going to look at the different types of cameras we can create, because we have things like cylinder cameras and fisheye cameras. We're going to look at different options for depth of field that we're able to work with, and motion blur from our cameras as well. I have a very basic scene setup of a tank. This scene is being lit using a sky dome light, but our sky dome light does not have a texture applied onto it. So if I render from my perspective view, we will see a generally lit tank in the middle of our scene. And this is fine for our purposes because we're going to be explaining the different camera types and how we use them. All of the Arnold cameras are created through the standard Maya camera. If I go to my rendering tab within Maya and create a new camera, I'm going to look at this in one of my perspective views. This will render within Arnold. We haven't assigned any new settings to it, and so all of the default cameras in Maya are Arnold capable cameras. But as well as the standard Maya controls for our camera, including attributes, film back, and all of our other options, we also have a Arnold menu. And this is where we're going to be spending most of our time, looking at the different controls we have in here. And the Arnold menu is broken down into four main groups. We have the camera type. We have a lot of different camera options in here that we're going to be looking at. We have an exposure control, so we're able to change the exposure of the camera. We have depth of field controls and how we're able to use that. And we have a UV remap control that allows us to apply lens distortion grids to our cameras in render. We're going to start off by looking at the different camera types. The first one we're going to look at is the cylindrical camera. If I change this to cylindrical, we'll notice that some of our other settings change. We have now lost our depth of field controls. This is because the cylindrical camera isn't considered to be a camera we would actually use at render time, but more of a utility type that we would use to create HDR maps or other maps from. If I then render from this camera's perspective, we will see something quite different from the viewport. As we can see, we are getting what appears to be a distorted image. And the layout and distortion of this image is coming from my horizontal and vertical field of view. If I increase my horizontal field of view, I can increase it all the way to 360 degrees. And this is now working as a cylindrical camera in the Y axis. I can increase my vertical field of view also. So I can see more vertically. I also have a toggle button for projective. And what this button does is it changes the method that the cylindrical camera uses to calculate its position. With projective on, it uses an actual cylinder to map our camera onto. With projective turned off, the camera will then work more as a pinhole camera that you might get in traditional photography. And all of our points will go to a central point in the middle of the cylinder rather than to a plane around the edge of it. The second camera type we have available to us is a fisheye camera type. And we will notice under fisheye that we do get our depth of field controls returned to us. Fisheye lenses are considered to be a creative lens that we may want to use to render a final image. Again, if I render from my viewport, we will see that we get a very different looking render using our fisheye lens. And again, these controls are provided by our fisheye camera. I'm able to change my field of view so I can have more of a fisheye lens and I'm able to change it from a full lens to a rectilinear cropped lens as well. When using the Arnold tab to control field of view values what we actually see in the viewport is incorrect. What I'm seeing here is the field of view being controlled by the camera attributes within the Maya camera. These are then being superseded by the Arnold fisheye lens. So when setting cameras up using a fisheye lens, it is always best to use the IPR render to accurately gauge how we're going to view our viewport. We're gonna be looking at the depth of field controls within the standard perspective camera, so we're gonna be moving on to another type. The next camera type we have is an orthographic camera type. And this works as a parallel plane in our scene. 
if I then view this render, we will see we get a perfectly parallel, non-perspective view. And again, we only have very basic controls for exposure. The next camera type is a spherical camera. And this is very useful for creating HDRI maps based on a 3D environment. Again, this camera type only has very basic controls because most of the time we are only using it as a utility. If we had a very highly detailed scene and we were only going to be lighting a small object in the center of it, it would be a waste to load all of the geometry just to light our object. And so what we would tend to do is to create a HDRI map of our 3D environment using this camera type. If I create an IPR render using it, we will see that we get a fully spherical image. It's important to note that we would have to set in our render settings a square lat long format for our render output as this is the best way of using it for a HDRI map. The last camera type we're going to look at is the perspective camera type and within this we get far more controls to be creative with our cameras with things like depth of field and motion blur. Without anything else turned on I'm going to start an IPR render using our new perspective camera and we can see we get the correct viewport based on our viewfinder as it is working together with the Maya standard preferences. If I then change my exposure, we can then see how it will lighten or darken my shot accordingly. The exposure control is done in stops of light. So between zero and one is one whole stop and will double the amount of brightness coming into the camera. If I go the other way to minus one, that will be one stop less and only have half the amount of brightness going into the camera. The depth of field controls allow us to have a very creative input into our lens or match to an existing shot camera lens that we will be creating CG elements with. If I enable depth of field, initially we will see no effect in our shot and this is because we have an aperture size set to zero. The aperture size specifies how large an aperture in the camera we should be using and an aperture of zero is the equivalent of a pinhole camera which has a very sharp wide depth of field. If I increase this to 0.1 we will then get depth of field within our shot. These are in world units and should be used accordingly. We will then need to specify a focal distance. With a focal distance of 10, we can see that we are getting the front of the tank in focus and the back of the tank out of focus. If we wish to have the back of the tank further out of focus, we will need to increase our aperture size. And as we do so, the depth of field becomes shallower. We can also see at the moment that we are getting very grainy out of focus areas in our shot. And this is being caused by the anti-aliasing quality. With the anti-aliasing set low, we will get very noisy depth of field within our render, and so to sort this, we must increase our anti-aliasing amount. By increasing the anti-aliasing, because this is a global multiplier, it may be the case that I need to lower values elsewhere in my render dialog. And we can see that with increased anti-aliasing settings, we get far smoother depth of field within our shot. We also have controls for aperture blades and the curvature of the blades. And this is dealing with out of focus areas in our shot, such as this area, where the out of focus area is taking on the shape of the lens that we are photographing it with. If I change this to be three blades, we will then get out of focus areas that have three sides to them as we can see here and here are on the top. If I change this to five, I will then get five sided highlights in the out of focus areas of my shot. I can also use the aperture blade curvature to curve each of these blades and the aperture rotation to change the rotation of each of the blades as well. The UV remap input, which is only accessible in the perspective camera type, allows us to add lens distortion to our cameras inside of our 3D render application. This is based off using a distortion grid to find out what the distortion of our real world lens is if we are matching into that. The final area we're going to look at is motion blur within our shot. If we scrub through the animation of this shot, 
we can see that the tank is moving and the tank goes past the camera through the shot but if I render we'll see that we don't get any motion blur that it appears to be still within our shot and we will find within our camera we will not have any motion blur options within our Arnold section or anywhere else within this our motion blur controls are found within our render settings if we open the render settings go to the Arnold render tab and down to motion blur we will find all of our controls here and these will be global to our scene a relevant of which camera we are using again if I render quickly we'll see that we have no motion blur at the moment but by simply enabling the motion blur within the render dialog and re-rendering we will see we have motion blur applied to our tank as it's moving through our shot again the quality of our motion blur as with depth of field is controlled by our anti-aliasing samples so where we can see we are getting quite noisy motion blur are being applied if we increase the anti-aliasing samples and re-render we will see that we get much higher quality motion blur in our renders we are able to specify what type of thing we want motion blur to be applied to we can have it applied to lights we can have it applied to cameras objects object deformations and shaders and dependent on our needs we can turn these off and on as necessary we then have additional controls for the actual look of the motion blur the shutter size specifies how much motion blur we want as we can see or a value of 1 which gives us realistic motion blur based on our frames per second as we can see here we can also increase the sample range which specifies how many frames we should use to give us our motion blur by increasing this we will get the appearance of a long exposure and a much longer motion blur train as we can see I can increase this further again to emphasize the effect as we can see though I'm going to reduce this back to 0.5 which is our default amount we can then use the shutter offset to specify how we want the motion blur to work relative to our frames a value of 0 will mean that the shutter will open at the start of the frame whereas a value of 1 means the shutter will close at the end of the frame giving us a different position for our motion blur we can also specify the filtering type that we use we have the choice between box or triangular filtering and we also have control for motion steps motion steps controls the number of points we consider when applying our motion blur with two motion steps we have our start and our end point based on our sample range by increasing the motion steps I get more points of consideration between my sample range I have changed the animation of my tank so now it rotates and based on that if I change my perspective view slightly as well with two motion steps I'll get rather blocky motion blur as we can see but by increasing the motion steps and giving more in-betweens we'll end up with a smoother appearance giving us a more realistic curve to our motion blur through the Arnold camera settings and motion blur render settings we are able to create highly realistic and accurate renders using real world lens information enabling us to match our CG elements into live background plates far more effectively and accurately